Jennifer Harima is a pioneering musician currently based in the state of California. Originally from Washington, D.C., Harima is best known for co-founding the influential rock and roll band Royal Trucks, which originally existed between 1987 and 2001, and released some of the most fascinating and challenging American underground music of its time. In 2015, Harima and her ex-husband Neil Haggerty reunited Royal Trucks to play shows, shifted their back catalog from Drag City to Fat Possum Records, and on March 1st, 2019, Fat Possum released White Stuff, the first new music by Royal Trucks in 18 years. Jennifer and I connected recently for a wide-ranging conversation about seeing bad brains when she was just 12 years old, racism and sexism in America, her relationship with Neil and the return of Royal Trucks, collaborating with Cool Keith, leaving Drag City, their new Fat Possum LP White Stuff, and much more. With the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly pledges at patreon.com slash creative control, plus in-kind support from CFRU 93.3 FM, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, this is the 465th episode of Creative Control featuring the fearless and innovative Jennifer Harima of Royal Trucks with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Jen. How's it going? All good. How you doing? Pretty well. Pretty well. Where in the world are you today? Southern California, sunny Southern California, uh, sun's out by the beach, but it's cold for us. It's like 35 degrees, which is very, very cold for us here in Southern California. <laughs> now, you are familiar with the cold from your time on the East Coast, I assume. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So is it laughable still to you like th- that this is considered cold, 35 degrees Fahrenheit? It is laughable, but... But I must say, I I I am kind of one of those people that is like I'm fucking cold. I don't know if I'm allowed to say you can, that. You can swear. You can curse. It's fine, particularly okay, so, if you're cold. Yeah. No. I mean, I'm just like I go outside. And I'm like I've turned into such a pussy. I'm like, oh my god, it's freezing. Uh, like, <laughs> I understand. I understand. Where were you actually raised? I know vaguely that you spent time in Washington, D.C. and New York, but where were you raised, per se? Born and raised in southeast D.C. Okay. Yes. Cold. That is a cold place. It's cold. I mean, I've been to colder places, but yeah, the East Coast, definitely. We had our fair share of snow and frigid weather, especially like getting to school like walk you had to walk miles it sucked <laughs> yeah okay well beyond that hardship how would you characterize your your time growing up in washington dc do you look back on it fondly was it uh did you see how it formed who you are today yeah yeah oh absolutely i mean that that that's there's no question about how like how instrumental you know where I where I grew up and what areas I grew up and how everything came to be. None of it would you know. I, you can't can't take it out of the picture. I wouldn't be here as I am today. So yeah, I didn't you know love it. I always wanted to get out of there, but at the same time, like being from Southeast DC, and then basically being like kind of bust out of out of my neighborhood, it was like a reverse busing, like to go all the way up to Northwest, I learned a lot of different things about a a lot of different scenes and cultures. And, you know, it was definitely instrumental in giving me kind of a, oh, you know, a wide, wide scope of influence and and stuff. And, you know, like back then, I don't, you know, I, I mean, DC was the murder capital, but it wasn't scary. Like I know people around here that they, they don't let their kids cross the street, and you know, and the kids are like eleven years old. Hmm. Like it's crazy. So back then, you know, my sister and I, we would like go hours to a whole other part of the city by ourselves. You know, so I think that the laxity that my 
Parents Aloud um, really gave us the opportunity to uh, to learn, you know, to teach ourselves and to learn about shit on our own hmm. in such an insular environment. I think for some of us, that period that you're talking about, sort of 70s, 80s, Washington, D.C., is characterized by the rise and contribution of Discord Records. Was Discord Records significant to you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the whole thing is, like, just kind of, you know, learning about it because that was kind of like, you know, in Southeast, you, that's there's none of, none of it. But, you know, go to Northwest and then you go to the record stores in Georgetown and, you know, they started having all ages shows so I could go see the Bad Brains when I was 12. You know, just kind of learning that there's more than just the radio at a young age um, and just kind of being able to participate, go to see live stuff at such a young age was definitely cool. Um, do you yeah. have, do you have a sense memory of what it was like to see Bad Brains at 12 years old? I do. I absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's just I remember. I mean, I remember the show really well. It's it was just the I'd never seen anything like it. You know, I was super young, like I was blown away. <laughs> like, and to this day, I'm still just like, yeah, it's it's palpable. I still, you know, I saw HR a couple of years ago. Actually, we were going to do something and and then I saw him like years before that and everybody was talking shit on him because he was like totally in the cool chill zone. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I love this because this is who this is who he is now. Like all these punk rock dudes wanted him to be like fucking slam dancing, stage diving. It's like, what the fuck, dude? He this is who he is now. This is just as cool. So anyway, I forever in you know, just love love hr that's awesome that's amazing i mean one thing that i've experienced when i come when i've lived in communities where stuff like that is occurring i mean god we didn't have i don't think i have the equivalent of seeing bad brains at 12 years old but i did go and get to see stuff and that provided sort of inspiration that access made me feel like maybe i could get involved is that the case for you like seeing such things being immersed in the community you were in did that inspire you to try to get into music well, I just, I just, I loved music. I never actually wanted to like do it or get into. I mean, I started playing the piano when I was a little kid. We had like a trashed out piano in the basement, and I, I really enjoyed it. But the t first time I had to do a recital, uh, it was like eight years old. I had to go on this huge stage with this huge piano and play in front of all these people, and I completely just. I improvised the whole thing. Like, I could read the sheet music. I just couldn't do I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't do it. So I just made an improvisational, like, you know, set, as it were. And then I told my mom I never wanted to get on a stage ever again. <laughs> so I just, like, basically, it's weird how that I actually ended up on stage. I, I'm still not that comfortable with it, but I enjoy writing a lot, and I enjoy singing and i you know i enjoy playing with great musicians yeah yeah no it's that's interesting that you were basically traumatized uh <laughs> and overcame that yep yeah <laughs> well, I mean, it's not like like i don't you know yeah I, I i still have my problems like with you know people staring at me <laughs> it's fucked up i guess that's also another reason like why i would just kind of Usually wore sunglasses or like had my bangs super long, so I could basically kind of have my eyes closed and go into my own world and and kind of shut the other, you know, the world of the people staring at me out, and then I could just kind of get free like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, all musical realms uh, suffer from too many having too many terrible men involved was it particularly difficult for you as a woman in your realm well i gotta say no it, it i gotta say it's more difficult now than it ever was it's strange i don't know why that is uh but there's been like some really really kind of like bla like blatant sexist shit that's gone on in the past like year and a half and like blowing my mind because i was like i never 
I never heard of it. Like that, I mean, I know that things happen to people, you know, I talked to other, you know, women and stuff, but I never, I mean, I guess one time in Nashville, you know, I mean, you know, sound men will probably say shit behind my back, but as long as it's not to my face, I'm not bo- bothered by it. But in general, I don't think I really, or at least maybe I just was not even aware uh, or people kept, you know, kept their snickering to themselves or something, but I was blissfully unaware of any kind of, um, uh, you know, um, marginalization or something like that. Uh, it's weird though. Yeah. I don't know why I've kind of run into like more of it lately not so much that it, you know that it kind of um ruffles my feathers but i kind of feel like people are so beyond they should be so beyond that at this point and it feels like there's a lot of regressive behavior actually going on in the past couple of years strangely enough um have you i, I from my perspective and living in canada and Living in our country, observing what's going on in the world, there's a real rise of a regression, uh, a pushback against progress. And I think, I, I don't know, Do you, I know you've said I don't know why a few times there, but do you think that might be a contributing factor, that it's all of these yeah. people just trying to fight back and keep things the way they were? Yeah, or I mean, whether it be religion, class, race, you know, um, sex, I think people are constantly looking for a way to, to find a place that they, they're they included. They don't really realize that, you know, in a perfect world, everybody's equally included. And that's like, another, you know, Royal Trucks from the get-go has always been super inclusive. And it it's always kind of bugs me that people want to categorize and marginalize themselves because because maybe there's just the world's too big and they just can't deal with the uh, with all the options you know maybe it just makes people feel more comfortable to to take a seat at whatever table it is you know hmm. that's interesting yeah i mean you've been doing this long enough that i think your perspectives are going to be very interesting <laughs> and you know i i appreciate that you're speaking on this to be honest because I think we are lulled into a sense that things are getting, as much as we're faced with horrible news all the time, it does feel like things, the fact that that people are airing that might be healthy, but it's interesting to hear your perspective that it might be worse. Yeah, I feel like the the airing of it, I feel like it's divisive. I feel like there is no middle ground. It's like, you know, you're either this or that. You're either a Republican or a Democrat. You're either, you know... For something or against something. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not really down with any kind of mediocrity, but I don't think that finding a middle ground has anything to do with mediocrity. I think it has to do with actual, like, intellectual uh, muscles being flexed because it's super easy to take one side and just leave it at that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, parsing the. Parsing the two sides is the harder thing to do, but that's inevitably what what you know brings you know, bring opens up the whole topic into things that are just not like you know two sides fighting. Is any of this coloring the work that you and Neil have come up with in this? And by the way, congratulations on first of all, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> for bringing rail trucks back, so to speak. Uh, I, I hope it's uh, meaningful uh, to you to hear something like that from someone like me. How is it feeling to be back, so to speak? Um, it, you know, it's, it's great. I mean, it's, it's great working with Neil again. Um, you know, like three years ago when we did the reunion, like I just, you know, it kind of came out of the blue. I never thought, you know, Neil you know, would ask to, like, start Royal Trucks again. And, 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 you know, I never had any thoughts about it. But when he called me and asked me to do it, I was like, yeah, okay, you know. Um, I was almost done with the new Black Bananas record. But we did it, and it just went, it was going really well. Like, you know, there was no way of knowing how it would really go, but it was going really well. So we just kind of rolled with it. Um, 
And yeah, I don't know. I the songs as far as kind of topical stuff in this song is like, you know, the ones like Suburban Junkie Lady, like I was t- talking to somebody else about it's you know, the the whole like like junkies of today, like they're just like, you know, suburban housewives like over you know down here at the you know at the shopping mall like dressed up pushing their baby carriages and yet fucking strolling around the the um parking lot looking for oxies it's just a whole new way uh you know it's an ex- i don't know an accepted way of being a drug addict or i don't know it was just interesting to to both of us having seen kind of this super insular, you know, non, non-dangerous, non, no, you know, uh, way of just becoming totally strung out. Like it would have been great to, to not have to run around on the streets trying to get score, whatever kind of drugs I would love to have gotten prescriptions. <laughs> you know, famously the Rolling Stones had, uh, Mother's Little Helper, you guys wrote Suburban Junkie Lady, uh, yeah. <laughs> which I thought was interesting. Yeah, yeah it is. It's a, I mean, it, exactly. The Oxys just replaced the Benzos or something, you know? Yeah, and that song in particular is, is almost like this damaged pop song. It's among the most catchy songs on the record, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it is. And, then, like, doing the background vocals, I was like, because, you know, like, I sing how I sing. I'm not trained or anything. So I felt like kind of self-conscious, but, but I was like, no, this song has to have that kind of a, a background vocal, like a, a sweet melodic to the degree I can, I, I can actually present that like kind of background vocal brought it all home. Yeah. And like know. you're doing like a round, you're kind of echoing the, yeah. Which is a cool, that's a cool idea. Like, it's it's great. You guys sound very vital. It's exciting. It's a great record, this record, White Stuff. Um, I can't help but ask about the the fact that the that Royal Trucks stopped and started. And I wonder, given that it's been many years since it stopped and now that it's back, I wonder if you can offer insight about that. Why you, why it stopped when it stopped and, and also why you feel like it was, the why you both felt like it was the right time to, to actually, beyond playing the odd show, get together and be creative together again. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it stopped because I, you know, a bit, I had to, I kind of just had to basically interrupt my life and upend everything because I kind of kept finding myself in a cycle of, of like self-destruction. Like I'd go years and years at positivity and then, you know, something traumatic would happen and I would just kind of just spiral back into like kind of self-destruction and I knew I had like it was a cycle and I could see it and I had to I had to break it and so I had to you know I told Neil like I gotta I gotta go away I I have to you know do some shit on my own I I can't be doing this I can't be I, I just need to change everything so I had to I just had to leave you know um has this and, been has this been clinically diagnosed in some way? Like I discovered that yeah. I have anxiety this year, so I'm dealing with well, that. Medication, yeah, I'm. I've been on medication for a long time, but but I'd say you know the the cycles that I went through most most of the cycles were pre you know pre diagnosis pre medication, um, more kind of like self medicating, um, but then even after. After you know, I you know got kind of on a on a medicated regime that was like super helpful. It it did not cut this like I you know I thought everything was great, but then you know when I heard my dad was gonna die in like a week, I just didn't. I just spiraled right back down and just like super self destruction again. And I was like, I've got to pull myself out of this. I have to I have to change everything. And I did, and I like it. It it was all for the best. Like I really, I'm I'm stoked about where I am in my life, and Neil's stoked about where he is, and it just all kind of it needed to happen. And so you know, I just just you know took that leap and jumped. So yeah, yeah, and then 
were you i mean you and neil sort of famously were in a relationship uh yes. a personal relationship and that also ended and that's prompted people to assume that that led to that precipitated the end of royal trucks is that accurate well, these, i mean that's part of it too because you know um you know, we were married, uh, and, you know, we owned property and a studio and stuff together, but, you know, it, and it was in the middle of nowhere in Virginia. So there was a lot of isolation around that, which is what we had wanted growing up in like, you know, I, me growing up in the inner city, I wanted to be away from dirt and noise and chaos. So I was really happy at the farm in Virginia, but it not, you know, not even the remote location could stop, you know, the, the self-destruction that just took hold of me again. And yeah. so, yeah, I had to, yeah, I had to leave my husband. I had to leave the band. I had to leave my house. I had to just, I just had to fucking go. And, you know, people were looking at me like, what, what is your problem? Like, Every, you know, you have everything. You're, it's great. And I was like, yeah, I know, but it's not fucking, I'm going to end up dying. Like, so yeah. I just to throw it all out the window and start again and just kind of have faith that everything would come correct at some point. And, and it all, it all just kind of did. So I don't know. I just, I just don't, I can't just sit still in something that, I know is not good for me and I know that I can do something about and I'd learned that much early on you know I didn't know that kind of stuff as a teenager but as you know once you go through the cycle of self-destruction over and over again it's kind of like okay you know you can it's there is some retrospect look you know like this is that same fucking cycle you know yeah well, I mean, beyond Royal Trucks, you have worked in other realms, correct? I, and I don't want to, I, I can try to, I know for some, like some of the things are modeling, you've uh, uh, well, you've worked in sort of fashion, I suppose, clothing lines. Is that accurate? Is, is there anything I'm missing? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was, you know, that all just started, that started on, you know, during Royal Trucks time was, um in fashion, it was the um, heroin sheet time. Yeah. And, you know, I was just asked to, to do a bunch of modeling, Cal and Klein, to, 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 stuff like that. And I'm not a model at all. Okay. Like, at all. <laughs> um, but, you know, I got paid to do a bunch of stuff like that, you know, and, you know, Having having had like Neil and I had been like so fucking broke until we you know signed with Virgin like we didn't even have bank accounts or anything prior to that so you know just being offered even you know money like you know Calvin Klein was offering was like yeah I'm gonna take that money you know <laughs> like what yeah the fuck? yeah totally and then but that was like that kind of thing but then really I mean. For the past 14 years, you know, I, I made um, four RTX albums and um, two Black Bananas albums, and I'm finishing up another Black Bananas album. And that's pretty much what's kept me really busy. But there's also stuff where, you know, people, like I said before, just because of the music, like I had Volcom, which is, um, which is, a uh, a skate and surf company, they, you know, they knew who I was and they just asked me to do a denim collection for them um, because uh, they liked all of my ripped up denim, you know, just whatever, because I always patch my own jeans. So I ended up doing collection with them for like five years I did stuff. Um, and so that, you know, that was just another incidental because they knew who I was type thing. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. And the same thing goes on. It's like in Japan, Hysteric Glamour, um, they make all this stuff with uh, Royal Trucks and Black Bananas graphics. And it's like super high fa and fashion stuff. I mean, it's only, it's only in Japan. And it, I mean, it's not here, but... It's it's just interesting because people people respond to the graphics and respond to I don't you know 
it's I, f- I find it fascinating that you've kind of recounted a few instances there where things sort of happen to you <laughs> like <laughs> opportunities like interest in your work interest in you and they just sort of wasn't something you were pursuing you were just like sure okay if that's what you want to do let's try it are you am i on to something there is that is that a trend yeah that i mean that's basically like i've always considered myself like completely unambitious but at the same time i realize like i am ambitious like in creating my own stuff like i'm always working on something and it seems that you know when i'm like kind of you know got my head down and i'm you know into something you know to the fullest extent it seems to me that's when people come and ask, like kind of ask me to go outside of my little my you know my insular self so it's kind of it's super cool the way it's worked out like that um yeah because i don't i wouldn't even know how to go about you know soliciting or selling selling myself as like you know a fashion designer or a, certainly a model like <laughs> it's just good i think you know positive energy i mean i know it sounds some hippie shit but positive energy and kind of being super focused kind of brings interesting things you know around you know i end up surrounding myself with some interesting interesting people interesting stuff it just kind of it's 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 working i'm not going to dissect it too much (laughs) (laughs) you mentioned some of the musical pursuits that you uh have released into the world like bands you've started records you've made in that interim period between uh, the dissolution of Royal Trucks and now that it's back. And you've been making music with Neil since the 80s. And on some level, when you broke apart, you you were doing something totally different. And now that you're back with Neil, I imagine you must have some perspective on what you two bring out of each other, so to speak, why the union is special and and I also within that, by doing something on your own, as much uh, doing the things you did on your own, I assume that might also inform what you and Neil work, do together in Royal Trucks. Can you speak to both of those things, the distinction between working with Neil and working without him and, and, and how those experiences have informed the new Royal Trucks? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think that that working, oh, I mean, working together since, you know, I was like 15 years old, I just assumed that, you know, Royal Trucks, like I never actually thought about Royal Trucks as to like who brought what to the table or this or that because it was such, you know, um, a collaborative effort. But like as I, you know, as I got older, especially when, you know, in retrospect, looking at kind of the cycles of shit that I would go through, I realized having been with Neil since I was 15 years old, I didn't even really know my own self. So separating was that opportunity to go and just like be in charge of everything and then be able to to learn from it. Um, And yeah. I feel like I feel like I understand, you know, and, and people would even write about it, like kind of um, like listening to the records that I made without Neil, Neil and listening to the records that Neil made without me, kind of recognizing what each of us had contributed to Royal Chucks just by listening to the separate music. Um, but then it's what is interesting is that I. You know, I know where our sensibilities differ. I know where th- they they completely cross paths. More often than not, you know, where our influences cross paths, but there are some definite um, sensibilities that are kind of like more. You know, I I mean, I'm, I was like grew up like loving you know radio and stuff, and anyway, so. Do it, coming back to do Royal Trucks, like, it was, yeah, at first it was like, well, what, you know, what is it, you know, what are we, is it, you know, how, how should we go about it? And then eventually it was just like, it's just, it's just me and Neil again. And we're still, he's still Neil, I'm still me. Um, we're, we're both like, you know, more autonomous at this point because, you know, we had been, 
like, you know, Siamese twins for so many years. Um, so, but when we got back to together, it was like we weren't trying to think of, oh, how can we make sure this sounds like Royal Trucks? There's just no way of doing that. So we just started writing together, and then next thing you know, it just sounds like Royal Trucks. It mm. just did. And I think it's really because of j the two of us, like the, the, the similarities and the differences still remain. And those two people, you know, myself and Neil, like coming together, uh, nothing kind of changed in as far as the relation to, you know, to working with each other. Because um, when we worked with each other before, it was always, you know, like I said, like collaborative, you know, I would write something, I would give it to Neil, he would be like, oh, let's do that part, and then I'd be like, okay, you know, it was going back and forth, and, and then it just always became one. Yeah. And it's kind of how we did it with this, although, you know, he lives in Colorado and I live in California, so all of our writing was done um, on the, you know, on the computer, we would email each other stuff, like, he was working in, like, in Logic, I was working in Pro Tools and just, you know, just kind of making stuff, you know, just making riffs and like melody lines, just real rough stuff. And then writing words and sending them back and forth and back and forth. And then kind of just knowing what kind of sounds we wanted and, you know, hoping that when we went into the studio and just kind of realized it all, it would just culminate in that thing that sounds like Royal Trucks and it, and it, and it just did. It did. So no, it's it's excellent. And you know, you were talking about how you grew up listening to the radio. Earlier, yeah. we were talking about the poppiness, the sort of damaged poppiness of something like Suburban Junkie Lady. And I hear it in Year of the Dog. Like there's this yeah. pop element uh, to Royal Trucks that is really interesting to me. And you know, over the years, as people have begun to reassess the band you keep coming across this term of music deconstruction that you're that, that somehow like Royal Trucks is this meta exercise about music. Do you relate to that? Do you feel like that, that's going on in, in how you approach songwriting? Well, you know, the whole meta thing is, is, you know, people are loving to use it at every turn, but, um, I don't, you know, it's not so much as deconstruction to me. I mean, it's semantics, basically, what I'm saying but is, but it's more about construction, like constructing something completely new out of all of the influences and out of all the things that have touched us in our lives. Like, we're not picking a genre and tearing it apart. We're, like, picking everything that we love and trying to build build something from the disparate pieces. So I would say it's more construction than destruction. Oh, okay, that's that's an interesting point of view, and and I like I I hear. Well, first of all, I, I need to ask about this because he's a hero of mine, someone I admire a lot. Cool Keith is on your record. Yeah, yeah, I love him. How did this occur? Well, um, Black Banana has played with Cool Keith um, a couple times. At, you know, I'd met him, and then. The song that he's on, Get Used to This, was actually an instru an eight-minute instrumental song that Neil had commissioned Alexis Taylor from Hot Chip um, and Tim Goldsworthy from uh, DFA Records. He commissioned them to do like a, a, a trucks mashup Euro disco style. So it was this total like Euro disco uh, instrumental thing that basically kind of went it was like it went from i'm ready into map of the city into mercury but like you had to really like it wasn't automatically recognizable hmm. but it was pretty pretty cool um and so we got that and you know i started talking to neil about how you know how we wanted to now take what they gave us and make make it our own. And I was like, man, it would be really, really cool to get cool Keith. I can like I can write him and ask him. And Neil was super into the idea. 
and uh, so it just it it happened. Like we had, you know, we had to edit the song down from eight minutes, like kind of chopped it a bit, you know, added his his vocals, Cookie's vocals, and mine were just completely freestyle, like off the cuff shit. And <laughs> just, I don't even remember what I was saying, but it, it that's how it happened. <laughs> He's amazing, Cool Keith. You can write him an email and he'll write you back. And and nothing has come of it so far for me. I want him on my show, you know. But uh, it's it's interesting that he's accessible in this way and wants to participate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about how you think this Royal Trucks music is more construction, rock and roll construction. We've talked about a few of the songs thematically. Do you, now that you've stepped back from it, the world's about to explore it for themselves. Do you have a sense of themes, uh, you know, recurring motifs or imagery that have kind of come up between what you and Neil have done and, and maybe what that might mean? We seem to, you know, we go, we write to what we know and we write to what we see, you know. Um, uh, that's kind of... I don't know. There's, I mean, which is, that's very, very unique to Royal Trucks because in RTX and Black Bananas, I make up crazy stories that have nothing to do with reality or my life. Like it's more fantasy. Royal Trucks is usually embedded pretty much in experience and some some form of reality. Um, so, yeah. Just, you know, kind of, there's a lot of mundane subjects, you know, you know, just w watching women, suburban women wandering around the parking lot um, and, or, you know, the guy that works at, you know, Burger King trying to get out of town because he fucking hates his life, you know, like I had a cousin like that, you know, just stuff that actually kind of touches something like when I you know to me those are the kind of things that stick with me do, um, do you and Neil talk about song lyrics do you do song lyrics emerge from conversations that you two have yeah like when we were you know when we were on tour like we toured Europe and did a bunch of festivals and stuff so we were like in the van for like three weeks together and we would just talk about shit you know just Kind of like different thing, like diff the way that the world's changed, but also the way that the world is completely not changed. And you know, I don't, I don't know exactly. You know, there's never like, okay, let's write a song about the, you know, the fast food worker. It's just kind of like, you know, on tour, especially with Burger King, because that's Burger King. They love some Burger King over there in the UK and Europe, like. <laughs> It's, it's everywhere. And you just, sometimes you just get a sense of the person, you know, that is behind the counter and talk, you know, I don't know. There's just experiences that, that can't, that just get stuck in my head. You, you've named the album White Stuff, which is provocative on a couple of different levels because there's, I, I it's fair to say there's a drug connotation, but these days we do talk a lot about uh, white stuff in terms of racism and yeah. racial just racial topics white stuff is the it has this for me the title has a double meaning do you want to say anything about the album title or the song well yeah i mean it it yeah it 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 is more than what it appears on on all sorts of levels but that's like for one like you're you having the knowledge you have you 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 perceived it that way which is how i perceive it too but Perhaps other people won't perceive it that way. Perhaps it'll be, you know, very didactic. The people will be like, oh, they do drugs. This is the drug or, you know, and it was it's, <laughs> it's kind of like we never really take ourselves that seriously, you know, and but we're, we're also like we're not like, oh, it's like a joke. Band. But, you know, there were such a long time, you know, we were we were defined, you know, by by our addictions and you know and and fuck ups and you know at a certain point you just kind of want you know want it to go away but people just love it they just want to talk about it. so we're like here okay we're just gonna put it on the front cover here 
I, I just because yeah. it's it's so far removed. It just made me laugh, and I was like, I don't know, if, I don't know how it's going to be un- understood or taken. I just know that it makes me laugh. So, <laughs> well, speaking of the sort of mythology around rail trucks, I think for a lot of us, you are associated with Drag City Records and nurturing artists like uh, Will Oldham. Bill Callahan, among others. Uh, I have to say, as a fan of the label, as a fan of you guys, I, for those who don't know, you've you've left Drag City for Fat Possum Records. You've taken your, as far as I know, you've taken the catalog of Royal Trucks releases with you. Can yeah. you t- talk about that a little bit? Because like I say, this seemed like, you were on Matador Records as well, you were on Virgin Records, but the Drag City connection seemed significant for, and it, I think it's safe to say it was, in terms of... Yeah. The musical it was, history, it's a significant union on many levels. Can you talk about the, the shift? Yeah, I mean, we started Drag City with Dan and Dan and Ryan, like, long, long time ago, you know. And I still consider, you know, Dan one of my best friends, but, you know, we don't talk now because I, like, you know, I, Neil and I have like all sorts of ideas and, you know, we want to, we want to try, we want to experience all sorts of stuff. We don't want to be held down. What We don't want to be told no. And we don't want to be on a label that use, is a collective mind. Um, when we want to do something, we can't wait for the label to determine if everybody else on the label wants to roll that way. We're autonomous. We always have been. They're the label. We're the artist. And we tried, you know, we tried to work it out to the best of our abilities, like, you know, to, to give ourselves the freedom that we absolutely deserve and should have, but keep, you know, keep some kind of allegiance to drag city, but they weren't going to have it. So we just had to leave. Hmm. Well, that's like I said, as a a fan of both, that's sad to hear. uh, But I appreciate your candor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not bad people, but it's just, it's kind of more, it's more of a, a project as, as opposed to, you know, a a seriously functioning record label at this point. Um, And there's nothing, I'm that's not a jab at all. It's just, that's just, that's the way they operate and you know which is which is fine but we wanted to do some other things that we could not do at all with them and they were basically not even going to allow and we're like you don't tell us what we're allowed we tell you do you so, do, do you mind ex- sort of expanding upon what sorts of things i'm just curious well the, well i mean it started it started with just simple streaming. I was like super against, I mean, streaming has been around almost 10 years now and I was against it for a long time because I was, I was like, Oh, well something, you know, something bigger and better is going to come and replace it. I figured it would become obsolete. So I wasn't really buying into it. Just like the B, you know, the beta VHS beta thing. I was like, (laughs) like, I'm not going to buy into it. But like, you know, three and a half, like four years ago, I was like, okay, this isn't going away. It's not, and it's not going to go away. And like every year that goes by that we're not part of the new reality is, is, is damaging. It's like, we're not, we don't exist in that world. And there's no reason why we, you know, and so, you know, the whole streaming conversation ensued and, you know, it was it, it was basically uh, you know Drag City was was gonna make they were gonna make the decision um, you know regarding streaming and I was like well because um, they were basically doing a collective bargaining using the whole Drag City roster to get their needs met. And so we were like, well, no, we're going to we're going to use our collective catalog to get our needs met. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I talked to him a lot about it and it we it just we had to go. But that that was the one thing that, that really flipped us out was that literally the day our shit went streaming, 
the next day Drag City did. And I was like, oh, that is too much. I thought that was, I, I was like, that is hilarious. Huh. Well, yeah. I'm friendly with people there too, and I, I appreciate your, your your perspective on it, and uh, I thank you for it. And obviously you've, you've found a more happy home at Fat Possum now. Yeah, no, everything is great. I mean, and there's no, I no, no animosity towards Drag City. Just kind of like, you know, I mean, you're, you know, like, I don't try and control, you know, my friends. I don't expect my friends to try and control me, like, creatively. There's got to be a, mi- that's what I was talking about, middle ground. Yeah. You yeah. know, this whole all or nothing thing. Well, that's how it, it ended up coming down to this all or nothing, which was a real shame. Mm-hmm. Well, for what it's worth, I, I do want to... It sounds like you and Neil are cool, though. <laughs> We're talking about relationships. You and Neil are good. You're feeling yeah. good. Royal Trucks is doing great. Everything's great. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line, yeah. Okay. Great. Well, I want to ask you sort of what I often ask people at this point. What's next? I know we're just talking about a record that's just out, but are, are there Royal Trucks plans, uh, touring, whatnot, uh, that you want to share? Yeah, yeah. Um, we... St- start well i believe we're playing london april 28th and then we start u.s tour may 10th and we do the east and the midwest um with wolf eyes or most of it with them and then we take a break and then we do the west i think they just announced the dates yesterday so they 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 should be all up on the internet internet i, I, I was going to ask you does royal trucks have a a whole, I often say, hey, tell people where they can go to learn more about you on the social media and the internet. Do you have stuff like that? Well, we a friend of ours runs, um, you know, she runs stuff by us, but I suck at social media. I only do my Facebook thing where I just kind of post, post stuff about, you know, the band and, and these types of things. But um, she's like on Instagram and and, and Twitter, um, and Neil does does Twitter too. But the two of them do that. I mean, I can't really tell you how much actual like you know didactic like informative information can be gleaned from the social medias. But they're, um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. If- <laughs> There's any one place you can go. I don't know. People should just look up Royal Trucks on the internet and they'll figure it out. No, but then they'll get Wikipedia, which is all wrong, too. So. <laughs> I hope uh, nothing I've said was particularly incorrect today, by the way. No, no, not at all. Okay. And, and and yeah, and I wouldn't assume that people would know, like, you know, everything anyway, you yeah, know. Yeah. How, so. How can everyone know everything? No, like, well. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a, a song from White Stuff that we can go out on, Jen, can you select one for us? Is there one that uh, you think people should hear right now? Purple, uh, Purple Audacity number two. Purple Audacity number two. I couldn't help but think uh, that this had some vague connection to Prince. Am I way off? Um, you know, uh, subconsciously, maybe, maybe that's why I put the purple in there. But the purple, Royal Trucks has always been, you know, very partial to purple, the color of royalty. Um, and the color, the, the middle ground color between blue and red, you know, the inclusive color. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Purple. But, um, yeah, and we were fucking, I was fucking around with this, um, this uh this audacity app and it just all basically we were just i don't even know why i called it that because i'm lazy maybe i don't know i mean (laughs) if if it was called anything else maybe i wouldn't have drawn the comparison but there is something about the delivery and the arrangement of the song that made it seem like a very gritty prince thing too i i I, I, i'm a huge prince fan so it, it completely you know i mean i'm a product of what you know what I've taken in. I'm, mean, you know, not raised in a Skinner box. I'm a product of my environment, and I love Prince. So who knows? It's the only note I have here beside this song, "Purple Audacity Number no. Two," and then I wrote Prince. <laughs> 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 so I am glad you picked this one because I enjoy it very much. Okay, this cool. is this is "Purple Audacity Number no. Two" by Royal Trucks from their new album, 
white stuff. Uh, Jen, this was such a great honor and pleasure to get to speak with you. You mean a lot to me and I'm sure to people listening. So thank you for your work and, and thank you for making time for me and best of luck with everything. Yeah, right back at you. <laughs> Till next time. Special thanks again to Jennifer Harima of Royal Trucks for being on this, the 465th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One podcast network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and also on Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, all over the place. It's everywhere. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for on any of your platforms, like any of the things you normally use, for some reason, you know, sometimes with the podcast feeds, they just they cut off the first 200 episodes of a show. You can't find them on your thing. Well, if you're looking for an episode that you've heard about and you can't find it, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, everything, everything you would need is at my website, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at vishcreative, or follow me at vishkana. You can listen to a radio show version of Creative Control on Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard Time around the world at cfru.ca, or on an actual radio at 93.3 FM if you're in or near Guelph. If you're in or near Guelph, come and visit us at CFRU. On the second floor of the University Center at the University of Guelph, we'd be happy to have you. We've had some people come by because of the show. I noticed that. They, they come and say, I've heard your show. I wanted to come and see what was going on. And that's nice. So come, come and do it. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep the podcast going. Things are getting a bit lean. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself for a job. So any uh, things are changing. I, I don't know when or how, but I can. it's happening uh, because of some work stuff. My day job is uh, 
under attack from the provincial government that I anyway it's a long story but our funding might be gone so I'm going to need work and uh, I'd like to but I'd like to keep doing the show if I have to get some kind of straight job I'd still like to I don't want a straight job I just want to be able to do the show if you'd like me to keep doing the show go to patreon.com slash creative control and if everyone who listened to the show or, or liked the show or followed the show on social media pledged a couple of bucks I'd be fine but that's not happening quite yet so please consider going to patreon.com slash creative control and making a monthly flexible donation right away thanks again to pizza trocadero the bookshelf and planet bean coffee in guelph and granddad's donuts in hamilton for their in-kind support of this show Uh, as always thanks to my pal jim guthrie uh, for letting me use some music of his on the show you can learn more about jim at jimguthrie.org and finally thank you thank you for listening to this episode other episodes if you're new to the show you'll see we're at episode 465 there's lots in the back catalog so uh, have a listen spread the word tell your friends subscribe to the show that's it that's all i have to say i will talk to you very soon bye for now